Hey friends, so if you're interested in working in the nuclear industry, if you're an engineer specifically, or even in other disciplines, this video, I'm going to walk through the whole hiring process for those that want to work in the nuclear industry. So we're going to go through everything such as resume development, what type of experiences do you need? So how much technical experience do you need? How to land an interview, right? Because that's, that's a really tough and difficult part, how the process differs from utilities versus vendors versus the regulator. And then I'm also going to talk about security clearances. That's not, that's a really important topic in the nuclear industry if you want to work here. And so let's get started. All right. So to start off, the nuclear industry is in its growth phase. Uh, it's growing a lot across the world. And so this video is about the process here in Canada and Canada's nuclear industry. However, across the world, there are a lot of similarities, right? These are regulatory requirements set by national regulators, but also international regulators. So you may find similarities in countries across the world. So no matter where you are, this video, you'll learn something from it. So enjoy. All right, to start off, if you're an engineer applying to the nuclear industry, having a nuclear background is definitely an advantage. However, if you don't have a nuclear background, don't be afraid to apply. Okay. Uh, the reason why is because nuclear is a niche industry. There's a lot of specialized knowledge in that industry, and they're always headhunting and looking for folks outside of the industry to come in as well. Okay, so don't be shy. However, if you've done a co-op in the nuclear industry, if you have a security clearance, if you're familiar with regulatory requirements or reg docs, that is definitely gonna be an advantage. So I hope you know that. However, the first step is getting an interview at a nuclear company. When you apply for a job, you may see two types of positions. One position is a very specific technical position. Okay, so for example, they're looking for someone that's very unique. I'll give you an example, a cybersecurity specialist. That's a very niche discipline, okay, that only a specific person can fill the void for. However, there are other postings which are bulk postings. You may uh, see a posting like assistant technical engineer or senior technical engineer. And basically what this means is that they may not be hiring just one person. There may be five, six, 10, 40, 80 people that they may be hiring. So in that case, do be specific about your experiences in your resume because your resume will be directed to the right hiring manager. The hiring manager will ultimately review it and then shortlist you alongside HR to make that matching process. Here's a short clip from a podcast that I did with a recruiter in the nuclear industry he talks a little bit more about this process. What are you looking for in, in, in these interviews? Yeah, sure. And I mean, that would really depend on the type of interview that is being conducted there. And I would say, you know, no matter what company or industry that you're interviewing for, having those conversations with the recruiter or the hiring manager ahead of time is always appropriate. Just to say like, hey, what kind of style of interview is this? Are we doing a behavioral based interview with some technical questions in it? Or are we just going to do like a technical question interview? Is there going to be a testing component? You know, asking about the structure of the recruitment process once you've been selected for an interview, it's totally appropriate because like the company and the recruiters already shown interest in you. So I think asking questions about in that kind of nature is totally appropriate and is definitely welcomed at that point. And then that gets into behavioral based interviewing itself. Uh, so behavioral based interviewing is something that's kind of taken, I guess, the entire industry, not only nuclear, just business world by storm and, you know, past decade or two. And really the idea of behavioral based interviews is that you're predicting future behavior based on past behaviors. And it's really just as simple as that. Getting your resume in the door is probably one of the most difficult parts. So first of all, there are certain companies like utilities or or government organizations where you can't really use a referral process. Okay. So second of all, many jobs in the industry, you cannot use references. And the reason why is because you know, nepotism and many other requirements. However, if you're applying for a consulting firm or other privately owned organizations, they actually recommend referrals. So you actually get a referral bonus for referring a good candidate. Okay. So there's differences in terms of how to get your foot in the door. Second of all, you may find that there are certain big organizations organizations which may have like two or 3000 people applying for one job at a time. So you may need to apply for a couple months or even a couple of years to get your foot in the door to just get an interview as opposed to other consulting firms or smaller companies where it's not as well known, smaller HR teams, and they have the time and the luxury to review resumes one by one. All right. So next is step number two. Step two is actually getting the interview. Now you get a call for an interview. You may get a quick call from uh, a recruiter and hopefully <laughs> you're, you're, you, you pick up your phone and the recruiter will set up a time with you and be like, hey, listen, you're having an interview for this position at this time, come in person or do it virtually. And, um, and here are the requirements for the interview. Do you have a G license? So they may ask you some basic requirements. All right, so like I said, you have your interview, you're scheduled it, 
All right, so step two is actually just mentally preparing for the interview. Prepare for your interview, guys. It's not a walk in the park. Remember, an interviews in the nuclear industry are not like tech. It's not like the tech industry where you have nine hour interviews or you have multiple days or multiple interviews at a time. The nuclear industry is a lot more simple. It's a lot more easy going. It's a lot more conservative. You may most likely have one interview before you get offered the job or maximum of two interviews. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I've noticed in terms of trend. All right. So, but however, I would recommend preparing that call from the recruiter is going to be really important for you to understand what are the details required for that role. Okay. So you may want to ask some questions at that point. Like I said, if you applied to one of those bulk postings, which is very normal for engineers or any other professional, you want to ask as many questions as possible. Possible. All right. So step three is actually the interview itself. All right. So you know the basics. There's the star method that you can use situation, task, action, and response. Okay. I still know what it is surprisingly. All right. So star method, use that. It's a very uh, globally, globally renowned method for interviews. However, you have to prepare for the interview depending on what type of organization you're applying for, as well as what type of skills you want to flex. Okay. Number one, if you're applying for utility, utilities have a a lot of roles which are a little bit more project management related. They are technical as well. However, they'll really focus and hone in on the behavioral aspect. They're looking for those collaborative traits where you can be a team player and really work alongside others in a group. However, if you're looking to apply for maybe a consulting firm or other organizations which are more private, more project driven, they may be a lot more technical. Okay. So depending on where you're applying and have the interview, you may have more behavioral versus technical questions. However, this is a very nuanced because it depends on the role itself. Okay. So a role at a utility, which is looking for a subject matter expert, that's a little bit more technical may have a more technical interview. Okay. So remember my advice is nuanced. It depends on what position you're applying for. However, I'm giving you broad generalized pieces of information for you to work off. Of. All right. So like I said, at times there will just be the hiring manager who can ask you the behavioral interview or the technical questions. And if you're lucky, there may be HR as well. HR may be on the side evaluating or actually asking the questions themselves. You may have had that dual pronged approach. All right, here's some example questions that I've been asked in interviews in the past. I'm going to read them out to you just so that you have a flavor of what type of behavioral questions you can expect. Tell us about a time that prevented you from completing a task. All right. So as you can see, kind of curveball question, how did you develop a relationship with a work group? Tell me about a time when you needed to coach someone. All right. So coaching is big in the industry, coaching up and coaching down as well. Okay. So for example, if your superior is not doing something correct, and you notice that you coach them, meaning you politely approach them and give them some feedback, let them know that, Hey, listen, this was not appropriate. And, um, and just let them know that, you know, this is something that we shouldn't do in the future. Another one is tell me about a time that you made a mistake. All right. So these are just easy behavioral questions that I'm throwing at you, uh, just so that you can get a flavor of what to expect. However, te for technical questions, if you're applying for a new grad role, I would say, watch my can do videos on the can do nuclear power reactor, especially the ultimate guide for can do. I think that is one of the best videos that so many people have given interviews in the industry, including directors and VPs all the way to co-op students and new hires have learned about the can do reactor from that video. So watch that video. If you get any can do related questions, you can answer them quickly. Um, if you're in a new grad position, I'm, I promise you, I don't think it's going to be that complex. However, check it out. They'll help you prepare for it. All right. So however, my last advice for interviews is when you give your responses, give your behavior responses, but weave technical answers into that. So for example, how did you build relationships? with different work groups while well, you can say, Hey, listen, I, I worked with different work groups and insert your technical experience and talk about how you worked in a collaborative way, um, and help manage a team or help uh, leverage resources. So that's, that's something that you can do. Use those technical uh, project related experiences and weave them into the behavioral answers. Okay. So that's a advice for you. Last but not least, uh, the step four is security clearance. All right. So this security clearance is uh, a really important part of the nuclear industry. It's actually a requirement by the Canadian Nuclear Regulatory Commission, CNSC, which is the national regulator. Countries across the world have the same process. They want to make sure that you're a reliable person that doesn't have a criminal history and that doesn't have a strange background. Okay. A strange background in a sense where you're, you're, you're not a criminal basically. Okay. Personally, this is something that I was a little bit hesitant and to be honest, a little bit scared about, right? Just because I wasn't born here, right? I wasn't born in Canada. And so I think, don't worry, it's a simple process. However, it does take time. Okay. It takes around three months, three to six months for a security clearance process to go through. And like I said, it's a requirement to work in a nuclear power plant. Even if you're not working at 
physically in the site, if you're working off site somewhere hundreds of kilometers away, even then you still need a security clearance. So again, a security clearance is a process that if you work in the industry, um, you pretty much have to go through. And, and depending on the nature of your role, you're gonna have a different level of security clearance. Uh, me being an office worker and you not being an office worker, you being an engineer, I would say, you know, our security clearances might look a little different, just you and I. Um, so just even, you know, having a security clearance is a really big thing. Um, and it can be a considerable asset as well. Uh, I think something that often gets mentioned is like, oh, I have a security clearance at, you know, a large employer in Canada that has security clearances. I mean, I'll say, great, put that on your resume because uh, the security clearance process is, is a lengthy one. Um, that does take a long time. Uh, no matter what employer you're pursuing in the industry, it takes a long time to go through it. Um, so if you can identify that you have an active security clearance, I think that's a huge asset. Um, security clearances are good for, for five years. Uh, so if you've done once, you don't have to do it again for five years. Uh, so that's just a great asset to have. So security clearance process, it takes, like I said, three to six months and they're checking your criminal history. So there's a site security clearance, okay, which is a basic security clearance. It's a class three clearance where you talk about your past five years or so of your criminal history, where you have lived, where you were employed. You give references, okay, so character references, family references. You can also give other references, uh, like a neighborhood reference is also requested. And this is really interesting because these uh, security clearance folks, they do a lot of research. This is this clearance is given by CSIS, which is the Canadian Secret Intelligence Services. Kind of like the Canadian FBI. So it is an intensive process. It does take time. And say, for example, you don't have the right information. A lot of the times the security clearance office will mail you back your clearance forms and be like, hey, listen, you need to fill this out again. So every major utility has a clearance office. And when I was filling out my clearance for the first time, I was on the phone with them a lot. I was like, hey, listen, like, did I get my information here right? Did I fill out the form correctly? And so it is a lot of paperwork. It takes time to get all that information down because for example, you may not have records of exactly where you went and traveled if you like to travel a lot. So I know for me, that was one thing that I had to trace down. So a lot of the times you may not have all that information on your physical passport. So you have to look that up. Also, another challenge that you may have is your colleague or manager that you worked with, let's say five or 10 years ago, they may not be in that position anymore. Their number may not be valid. So alternatively, you have to figure out another approach or maybe give them a call in advance, let them know, hey, listen, first of all, just see if their phone number is still active. So there may be challenges there. I've heard of uh, instances where people have come from across seas and the security clearance office had trouble reaching the people on the other side of the world. So that may be another issue that you may anticipate. I would recommend just stay conservative, use the best information that you have at the moment and uh, you'll be good to go. Don't be afraid. There are other levels of security clearance. So there's a level two security clearance, which is a secret clearance. It's uh, an elevated level of clearance where you even have to give information about your in-laws, right? Like here's where my father-in-law works. Here's where my siblings work. Here's, <laughs> here's their information. Here's what they do for a living. So it's deep, deep. However, that level of clearance is usually only required if you're working on the security side of things, or if you're working more where the information that you are going to be holding is a little bit more selective and safeguarded. All right. So there you have it. So after you get your security clearance, step five is actually onboarding, starting your work. You're going to onboard in whatever company that you're going to start with. There's a lot of basics that you're going to be learning. Remember the entire learning process. The nuclear industry is, has a lot of a tribal culture or tribal knowledge. And so you're going to immerse yourself in there. So if you're new to the industry, don't be scared. You're going to have a great time. If you're already in the industry, you know how it goes. So there you have it. If you have any questions, please do ask in the questions below. I do love hearing from you guys. So till then, take care.